Welcome back to another drop-in reading session for one of the Jataka Tales. And today, the story that we are going to be working with is going to be this one, The Case of the Gnawed Leather, the Kukura Jataka. That's our story for today. So I'm going to pull that all the way up for us so that we can experience this story for this week and see where it takes us, see what it leaves us with, and see what we bring to it. So as always, I welcome everyone and would like to um, encourage everyone to, before we begin, to actually do a nice deep cleansing breath, just to bring us all together into the space together, all of our readers to bring us all together from wherever we are in the world, um, because we're sharing this space right now and we're sharing this time together right now, which is a really beautiful thing to be able to read this story aloud to ourselves and in our imaginations to one another. So let's do that. Let's just sit comfortably in our seats, however you are sitting down or lying down or whatever position you are in to do this reading together. Then let's just be comfortable in that position and take a nice deep cleansing breath in. And release it gently. Beautiful, great. Now we are ready to proceed with the case of the gnawed leather. So it sounds like we have a bit of a mystery on our hands today in, the, uh, in this particular Jataka tale. And remember that all of our stories are, in, are actually um, based on ancient tales. They're based on ancient stories that were actually utilized and reworked, if you will, to be relevant to the teachings of the Buddha. So in each of the stories, they, each story articulates a particular incarnation of the Buddha, and it shows us whatever that message is that, um, that we should be drawing from the story. And, and actually that message can be quite different for different readers. Um, I always invite everyone to experience the different perspectives that can be found in each story by reading the voice of the different characters. So the characters in this one, the case of the gnawed leather, the characters that we have, we have the grooms, we have the king who is also known as sire or your majesty you'll see the same character referred to these different referred to under these different titles we have the dogs we have the dog chief who is also known as either leader or great dog or wise dog and then we have the buddha as well as one of the characters and so you can kind of look at those characters and decide for yourself oh i think today i feel like reading as uh, one of the grooms or no, I read for one of the grooms yesterday. So today I think I'm rereading this story for the second time. I think I'm going to read as one of the dogs. So however you feel, um, whichever one of these characters you feel perhaps a karmic connection to, maybe it, it just juggles something in your mind, or maybe you just want to experience that. Oh, okay, I want to hear this story through the voice of the dog chief for example or you can also read along with me as the narrator so it is absolutely your choice enjoy the story however you decide from whatever perspective perspective you decide to read it from so let us begin it was while staying at jetavana that the buddha told this story about acting for the good of relatives Long, long ago, when Brahmadatta was reigning in Varanasi, the Bodhisattva was born as a dog. 
He lived in a great charnel ground as the leader of a pack of several hundred dogs. One day, the king rode out to his pleasure garden in the royal chariot drawn by milk white horses. After amusing himself all day in the garden, he returned to the city well after sunset. Hungry and tired, the king's men hurriedly unhitched the horses, but they left the chariot in the courtyard with harness and reins still attached. During the night, it rained heavily. The next morning, the grooms discovered that the leather of the chariot and harness had gotten wet and had been gnawed. They immediately went to the king. Sire, they reported, your majesty's chariot has been ruined. It seems that during the night, dogs entered the courtyard through the sewers and gnawed the straps and the beautiful leather work covering the chariot. Now, just as a note, whenever you see um, a particular name of a character in red, that's just to cue you that if you're reading for that character, then you have some lines coming up. Enraged, the king shouted, kill every dog you see. The king's soldiers immediately began roaming the streets of the city, killing every dog they found. The dogs were terrified by this wanton slaughter and sought safety in the charnel ground. Why are you here in such great numbers? Asked the chief. What is happening? The king is so infuriated by reports that dogs gnawed the leatherwork and straps of his carriage, they answered, that he has ordered that all dogs be killed. Throughout the city, dogs are being destroyed wholesale. We are in great danger. The leader thought about this and reasoned to himself, the palace is closely guarded. It would be impossible for an animal from outside to get inside. This must have been done by the king's own thoroughbred dogs. But now innocent creatures are being executed while there is no punishment for the real culprits. I must try to save the lives of these dogs, my followers. He comforted his relatives saying, have no fear, I will save you. But to do it, I must see the king. Protecting himself with thoughts of loving kindness and calling to mind the 10 perfections, the leader stealthily made his way alone into the city. Because of his kindly thought, he was able to reach the palace safely without encountering anyone. He ran straight to the hall of justice where the king was seated and dived under the throne. The king's servants tried to catch him, but the king stopped them. Emboldened by this, the great dog emerged from under the throne, bowed to the king and asked, sire, was it you who ordered that all the dogs be destroyed? Yes, it was I. What was their offense, your majesty? Dogs gnawed the harness straps and the beautiful leatherwork of my chariot and ruined it. Do you know which dogs actually did the mischief? The great dog asked. No, I do not, the king answered. But your majesty, if you do not know for certain who the real culprits are, is it right to order that every dog be destroyed? It's very simple, said the king. Dogs gnawed the leather of my carriage. So I ordered that all dogs be killed. That way I am sure to punish the guilty dogs. Do your men kill all dogs without exception? The leader asked. Or are there some dogs who are spared? Some are spared, of course. I am not going to kill the thoroughbred dogs of my own palace. Sire, just now you said 
that you had ordered the slaughter of all dogs because dogs had gnawed the leather of your chariot. Now you say that the thoroughbred dogs of your own palace are spared. In this, you are following four evil ways, partiality, dislike, ignorance, and fear. Such behavior is wrong and not king-like. When a king tries a case, he should be as unbiased as the beam of a balance. In this instance, however, you are allowing the royal dogs to go free while you are merciless, mercilessly massacring poor stray dogs. What you are carrying out is not the impartial destruction of all dogs, but rather the slaughter of the poor. Your majesty is not acting with justice. The king listened carefully and replied, you speak wisely and I am impressed. Tell me, in your wisdom, do you know who actually gnawed the leather of my chariot? Yes, sire, I do. Who was it? It was the thoroughbred dogs of your palace. Can you prove this? I will demonstrate it to you. Do so, wise creature. Please provide me with a little buttermilk and kusa grass and send for your dogs. When this was done, the great dog instructed the king's men to mash the grass, to stir it into the buttermilk, and to feed it to the thoroughbred dogs. A few minutes after the dogs had drunk the mixture, they began to vomit. When the king's men examined the vomit, which the palace dogs had brought up, they discovered bits of leather. There is your evidence, sire the wise dog exclaimed. What a perfect judgment, cried the king. He was so pleased that he offered the royal umbrella to the king of the dogs who established the king in the five precepts. Then he returned the white umbrella of kingship and encouraged the king to be steadfast and righteous. The king immediately ordered that the slaughter of dogs be stopped and further that all dogs be given food fit for the king himself. The king was so moved by the teaching that he also ordered that the lives of all creatures in the realm be protected. He spent the rest of his life in generosity and other good deeds and when he died, was reborn in heaven. The wise dog lived to a ripe old age before passing away to fare according to his deserts. His teaching endured for 10,000 years. Having concluded his story, the Buddha identified the birth. At that time, Ananda was the king. My followers were the dogs of the pack and I was their wise leader. There we have it. The perspectives to be found in the case of the gnawed leather. So as always, at the closing of our story, I invite you to take another deep cleansing breath, just to allow all that insightful, wise energy to just soak into our very pores so that all of that text can just settle in and we can allow ourselves to turn it over in our minds and see what we draw from it. So let's take a deep cleansing, closing breath together. and release that breath. And 
And with the release of that breath, we release ignorance, we release obstacles, we release all destructive energy. So in this coming week, I invite you to walk with the ideas that we found in the story, the ideas of justice and how justice plays out in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, the ideas of being constructive, of bringing constructive ideas to the table to discover solutions to problems in a very broad context. I invite you to walk with those ideas. Think again, as always, about the different perspectives of the characters. For example, the perspective of the king, the perspective of the leader of the dog community, um, to, to feel what those characters may have been feeling in going through these situations that we found in this story. And in terms of our own day-to-day -day lives, what are we feeling when we see before us situations having to do with justice, having to do with execution even? We see in this story a thread about capital punishment when we hear about all the dogs being executed no matter what and whether or not that was just because some of the dogs, of course, the thoroughbred dogs, the ones in the royal court were set aside, even though they were the guilty ones, they were not executed because of their status in the society. So we can think about those things. Um, all of these ideas we can walk with in this coming week until it's time for us to come together, back together again as readers to read the next Jataka tale. Until then, I wish you well. And please be safe, be well, keep reading. Peace and blessings.